What's going on guys, Waco and Jeremiah Chan and Bandit the Watchdog. Hello Bandit. And guys, today we're here to talk about one of Bandit's favorite subject matters, it's wristwatch tourbillons. But Bandit, I'm gonna put you down for a second so I can pick up the watches, okay? So, have a seat. So today guys, I wanna to talk to you about two tourbillons that we happen to have in the office. One is my personal watch and the other is a watch made by a guy I consider to be a pretty brilliant watchmaker, mm. Karsten Fresdorf, who has a brand called Montre Kf. Right. right. And maybe we'll start with that watch because the way in which I discovered Montre Kf was um, I was in the panel of the jury for the Geneva Grand Prix last year and his woman's watch was nominated. Mm. And I took a look at it and it was a tourbillon, but not just any tourbillon, it's a stop second tourbillon. Wow, incredible. I don't think that many companies have a stop second tourbillon. I think probably IWC, yeah. uh, Mont Blanc, Gronenfeld, uh, Gronenfeld, I think Alain and Zone as Alain well. Zone yeah. and, and Morris Grisman. Yes, right? yes. But it was really interesting because in all of those scenarios, you'd stop the cage one of two ways. Either you stop the cage itself or you stop the balance wheel. Right. right? So I think that the only two where you stop the cage are the Gronenfeld Parallax Tourbillon and the Chopin Flying T. Right? Oh, okay. And all the others, you're stopping the balance wheel. So when I pulled the crown on this watch, the tourbillon immediately stopped. Mm. And I was like, what the hell? I don't see how this is being, you know, You don't stopped. see the levers on the exactly. front, right? And then I um, only later discovered that actually the braking system's from behind, right? Incredible. So it's underneath, it's actually on like the, basically the pinion of the tourbillon cage, okay. right? And there's a little like brake uh, disc on there and it, uh, there's a lever that lifts it up and it stops the balance wheel, which is incredible. Yeah. But then I started to think about it and I started to realize actually this watch, this tourbillon, and actually a tourbillon that I own, uh, the Debethune tourbillon, it's a DB28 uh, kind of blue tourbillon, mm -hmm. they're actually pursuing very similar goals, right? right? Yet in very, very different ways, yes. right? So I think that what's really cool about Denny Flagelet and about Carson Fresdorf is that they're both trying to create tourbillons that have a real justification for being in a wristwatch. Because as you guys know, tourbillon was initially created for pocket watches in 1801, was patented by Abraham Louis Breguet, mm -hmm. and that was for a watch that was sitting vertically in yes. your, your, your waistcoat, right? And the whole idea was basically when the watch was in the vertical position, right, you would get uh, errors caused by gravity. Basically, the hairspring wouldn't breathe concentrically, you'd have some friction on parts. So mm -hmm. Breguet's solution is I want to put everything inside of a cage. Uh, it's going to rotate once on its own axis every minute, and it's going to average the errors over one minute. And the word tourbillon actually means in French whirlwind. Mm -hmm which is what it represents or actually replicates the sort of motion of a whirlwind. But then the question is, of course, what does a uh, tourbillon have to have any you know, rationale yeah. for having That's one of the modern day criticisms as well, because when you wear uh, a watch on your wrist, right, it's often in various positions already. Right. It's being moved in various positions. So why would you need a tourbillon? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it, it, it you know, adopts so many different positions. And second of all, a watch is susceptible to uh, micro shocks almost mm. like every single moment, yeah. right? Like whether you're clapping your hands, you're just putting your hand on the table, if you're, I don't know, cooking, right. or- Or if you're playing sports. Playing yeah. sports or driving or whatever, it's always like, you know, receiving some small amount of shock. So I remember when I spoke to Denny Flagelet about creating a tourbillon, he said, you know, way I wouldn't mind creating a tourbillon, but my tourbillon has to have a rationale for being in a wristwatch and it has to address all of these issues. And what he did ultimately was to make a tourbillon that is most resistant to the micro shocks that a watch receives all the time. And mm -hmm. How did he do that? Well, he wanted to make his balance wheel and his tourbillon cage as light as, as possible. So in order to create a balance wheel that has as ma much inertia as possible for being as light as possible, he used a combination of silicone and white gold, right? So you, in this balance wheel, you've got a forearm of silicone, which actually are perforated. Yeah, drill holes it, it, it in drill holes in exactly, it, right. To make it even lighter. Right, right? so it's, what, it's done in the, in the car industry as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then, and, and, well, okay, so it's grown in, in that shape. Um, and, and then you have a white gold rim, which means that it's the, all the inertia is sort of poison, the rim of Correct. the balance wheel. Correct. Then and on top of that, you place this entire device inside of the world's lightest tourbillon cage, which weighs? 0 0.18 grams. Which is crazy, it's right? crazy. What's that? How much does that weigh? I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. I don't even know what to compare that <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. And then uh, um, it, it rotates, um, the tourbillon cage rotates twice a minute or mm. every 30 seconds, mm. averaging the errors twice as fast as a normal yep. tourbillon. And then on top of that, the balance wheel vibrates at five hertz, right? So you've got something very light that's vibrating super fast and that's rotating super fast, right? What other tourbillons are, are high beat like that? I don't I, think I, so. They are I, any. I don't think I can think of one either, yeah. you know? So, and then what I love about that is that in theory, you've created therefore a, a tourbillon and an oscillator that like is able to shrug off microshocks really easily right. because it's moving so fast mm. and it's so light as well, right? right? 
So let's go from there to Carson Fresnel solution, which is almost to go in completely the opposite direction. Mm. But we should say that this watch is, first of all, really resistant to shock. Like how many, how much are resistant to apparently? 5,000 Gs. That's crazy, dude. Right? Which is what another watch can do, yes. right? I think it's the Richard Mille Ferrari. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, there's a couple of Richard Mille's that are resistant to 5,000 Gs, mm. but those are watches that were built from the ground up right. to be anti-shock watches. Yeah. So how is it that Carson is able to do this? Well, there's a couple of things that are really interesting about this. First of all, this movement's a pillar movement. I think the pillar architecture is, is reminiscent of the design from the 18th century, the marine chronometer by Precisely. John Harrison, right? Exactly. You know, so, so it was Jean Antoine Lepine uh, who actually kind of revolutionized the watch movement by taking off the top plate and removing the pillars, mm. right? Uh, but then that's also because he wanted to make watches much smaller because at the time, the fashion in the French court was to wear very tight waistcoats, believe, oh, really? believe it or not, <laughs> right? But Karsten's gone back to a pillar movement, which is super, mm. super stable, right? Then on top of that, he's put a a massive balance wheel in there inside of a massive cage with a really interesting hairspring. Tell us about the hairspring. I think the hairspring has two different curves, right? First of all, it's made of a Strauman uh, alloy, right. which is resistant to 1,000 Gauss, which right. is the same as a Rolex mil Gauss, right. right? And the two curves, one is the Grossman curve, which you will find it at the middle of the balance uh, at the Colette. Yeah, the inner right? curve. Yes, correct, the inner curve. And that's uh, meant to compensate for the Grossman effect right, which creates errors in the vertical position. And then obviously you have the Phillips curve or what people would probably know as a Breguet overcoil, which is uh, trying to, to have the hairspring breathe concentrically uh, at the point of the mounting. Exactly. At, at the hairspring step. So you got a hairspring that's got two terminal curves, an inner terminal curve that's got a Grossman curve and an outer one which has got a Breguet overcoil or a Phillips curve, right? Which should allow us to breathe super, super concentrically. Right. Like well, Karsten explains it to me that like, okay, if you've got an overcoil, it only affects the outer sort of like spirals. Mm. And then if you've got an inner curve, it only affects the inner spirals. So you yeah. kind of need them both. both. He, exactly. he wanted them both. But then on top of that, you've got this crazy and incredibly cool balance wheel. So, oh, Jeremiah, tell us what a bimetallic balance wheel is. Well, the bimetallic balance, the original one, it's made of brass and steel. Brass on the outside and steel on the inside. And steel being, you know, a harder metal than brass. So as temperature affects the balance wheel, the brass expands and contracts. And it pushes and pulls against the stainless steel. Yeah. Right? It changes the inertia. Correct. It, right. changes, it changes the inertia based on how the temperature is affecting the stainless steel hairspring at the time. So what happens is if you have a hairspring uh, back in the day, right, and it's being affected by changes in, you know, uh, temperature, which means it's either gaining or losing elasticity, mm. you have a balance wheel that's changing its inertia to compensate for that. Correct. Which is Correct. freaking crazy, dude. Yeah. But then you had Guillaume come along and he invented, you know, Envar and Elinvar, and then you right. basically had thermal compensating balance wheels. I think he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in, in 1920 well for done. those two inventions. Well done, sir. <laughs> but I think it's incredibly cool that Carson decided that he want to kind of do a homage to that and mm. create a bimaterial balance wheel, right? So this is one of the very few balance wheels that I can think of in the modern world that actually changes its geometry, right? It's actually changing its inertia. Yeah, but not with brass and stainless steel, obviously. Not with brass and stainless <laughs> steel, with sapphire crystal, which is using for one of the arms of the balance wheel, and then metal, which Carson won't tell me exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Trade secret. Exactly, but if you look at the design of the balance wheel, it's insane. So you've got the sapphire arm traversing the balance bridge, and then underneath, on each side of it, you've got these metal elements to it as well, and then on top of that, you've got these, you know, like, uh, like inertia weights, which incidentally Carson can transform or customize into whatever design you want. So if you want to have oh, like, cool. yeah, you know, like a star in there or, you know, like a, your initials or whatever, he can right. actually change that wow. into that. And then on top of that, there's another two arms that have two weights on there. One for, you know, um, uh, like large regulation and one for fine oh, tuning okay. as well. So the whole balance wheel itself is an absolute work of art, right? So I, I think this is actually incredible. So this balance wheel beats at a traditional rate of 18,000 vibrations, mm -hmm. which is actually half the rate of the De Bethune, and yet somehow is able to also be perfect for a wristwatch because it's so shock resistant, right. because it's amagnetic, and because he's thought of all these incredibly cool things from the past to put into a contemporary watch including a stop second function. What, what I think something else is interesting is if you look at the fixed fourth wheel, the teeth are pointed inwards because uh, the escapement is on the inside instead of the outside, which is what we often see in other tourbillon design. And the last thing that I find really cool about this watch also is Karsten has is, is designed the movement so you can actually take apart the tourbillon mechanism itself mm. in like five minutes and just remove wow. it from the like movement. a module. Yeah, exactly. You can pull that out and like send it to get serviced. Or That's a watchmaker's dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, he's a watchmaker. Mm. So I would have to say like what I love about these two watches is they're both such unique um, solutions to the issue of actually having a 
October, you'll be relevant in a wristwatch. Mm. Denny flies away in costume for Esdolf. Um, this is the kind of blue DB28 tourbillon, which is unfortunately no longer made. Uh, it's my personal watch, but they still make those tour, uh, tourbillons with the same design and the same architecture, of course. And this is Karsten Fresdorf's 8 Evolution Meteorite. Right? Yes. It's got a meteorite dial and it's got a rose gold case that has the texture of meteorite into it as well. Yep. If you haven't checked out one of these watches before, please try to. But I have to say, from the perspective of a tourbillon, this thing is pretty mind blowing. Would you agree? Yeah, completely agree. It's just innovation after innovation. Uh, and if you happen to own either of these watches, come holiday in Singapore and yeah, you'll be fine. Wear them in safety. <laughs> yeah, wear them in safety. <laughs> exactly. Cheers. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Cheers, guys. See you again. Peace. Bye.